Today I'm going to be taking a look at a pretty cool micro brand called Tesseno. Just full transparency, they did send me this watch to review. They don't have any creative control over what I say, um, but they did lend me the watch for about five days, so thank you for that. And let's get into the review. So we have a diameter of about 39 and a half. The bezel is slightly bigger than the case, so the case itself is about 38.8. Lug to lug, we're looking at 47 millimeters, and we have a height of 12.8. Some other general specifications for this watch, we're gonna have the Ronda R150 movement beating away in here. This is one of those other, uh, you know, Miyota 9015, Eta 2824 type of clones. Uh, this one I've never experienced in a watch before. This is the first time I've come across it. Some of the main reasons the brand went with this movement is they already had a relationship with Ronda. It also has better availability than the Salida or ETA movements. Uh, and on top of that, this actually is I believe it's 0.2 millimeters thinner than the counterparts, the Miyota 9015. So nothing too bad about it. I would say when I am using it day to day, it has a little bit of a crunchy feel to it, but we'll get into that later. We do have a double dome sapphire crystal with AR coating. You can kind of see the blue AR pop in and out. We have 200 meters of state of water resistance with a regular screw down crown. 120 click unidirectional ceramic bezel here. BGW9 Superluminova on anywhere that there's a loom, which is basically every kind of white part on the face of the watch. And last but not least, this watch retails directly from Tuceno for $649. So starting off with the dial here, and I think the dial is incredibly well done, especially considering the price point. I mean, to be fair, nowadays micro brands are coming out with some amazing dials, but this one I think has a lot of life to it. We do have a really nice linear brush dial here, and because of that brushing effect, it does have a nice color depth to it. You can see here at certain angles, it's almost very black, very navy. At other angles, it's very bright, uh, vibrant blue comes out, the texture comes out at certain angles, the uh, texture disappears, but sometimes the color stays. It is a very interesting and lively dial, and it's nice because you don't necessarily want your watch to be the exact same color, exact same feel 24 seven. It's nice to kind of just look down at your wrist and it feels different. We do have a nice sandwich dial here. You can see there is a more base layer to the dial which holds that BGW9 loom. You can see we have circular cutouts in the dial for these two hour blocks and it, it has a uh, rectangular marker at three, six, nine, and a double marker at 12. I do think the dial layout is pretty pleasing. I do like the depth created by the three dimensional uh, sandwich dial. You even have the outer minutes track or seconds track here. I mean, technically it's both. Uh, that is also raised above the dial as well. So you really do have three different layers to the dial which all come together really, really nicely. We do have a handset I haven't seen many times before, nonetheless in a dive watch. It is a, almost like a skeletonized Mercedes handset or even a, I believe it's called Pontiff handset, which is a little bit more dressy, but this is almost like the sportier version of that. Uh, to me, I do like the handset. I do think it blends well with the design, but the way it's done here, I do think the kind of uh, hour hand itself is a little bit too small. It's very much smaller than the hour markers, and I think that looks a little bit at odds in the design. Had they made the hour marker bigger or the pips smaller by comparison, I think the design would have looked a little bit more cohesive. And personally, I would have liked to just see a, a bigger hour hand. It would have given a little bit more kind of punch to the dial. It would have been a little more interesting. Uh, maybe be, you would have to thin it out a little bit and you wouldn't be able to apply loom as well, but it, that might be a kind of give and take trade off that I'm willing to make. We do have very minimal text here, which I do like. We just have the brand name at the top at 12, Tiseno Goatberg. I'm pretty sure that's not how you say it, but <laughs> that right beneath the brand name, because I believe that's where they're kind of based out of. And then the model name here at six o'clock done in kind of a curve style shell back. I think it looks very pleasing. The text isn't too large. It isn't too bright, too in your face. It obviously color matches with the rest of the dial. And uh, again, they didn't really go for any frivolous text. It doesn't say automatic. It doesn't say 200 meters. It doesn't say dive watch. It doesn't say anything really that's unnecessary. It, it is well done. Uh, it is sparse and it lets the rest of the dial shine. Overall, I really like the color depth here. I really like the way it plays with the light. I like the three dimensional dial. And I think overall it is not a perfect dial, but it is very well done. Taking a look at the dial in natural light, you can see it does take off a very dark, dark tone, but when you move it around, you get light on the dial. It definitely brings out the color in direct light even more so. But surprisingly, again, it can still go very dark even in direct sunlight, but you get that beautiful, beautiful color shift depending on the angle. And then you can just kind of see as you move it around between light and dark, you get darker shades of blue, lighter shades of blue, vibrant shades. It's just, it's a fun watch. One thing I have not mentioned at this point is that this is just a sample model. This is not a full production model. It is fairly close based on what the uh, brand owner has said to me. But um, as you can see, there are some like QC issues that I do think would be straightened out a little bit more on production versions. 
but as it stands, it still does look pretty good. And let's uh, take a closer look. As you can see, once we get closer in here, that linear dial brushing really does come out to play a lot more. You do see those vibrant tones of blue pop out at you. There are darker striations, lighter striations that all come together to just give a really, really unique color depth to the dial itself. Something you don't really notice until you zoom in closer here is each of these hour markers is surrounded by this kind of speckled, almost like subtly sparkly paint here. Uh, it looks really good. It is a little bit more silver than it is pure white. It does obviously stand out from the dial and honestly it doesn't perfectly color match the BGW9 below it. But I honestly don't think it's at huge odds so it doesn't really detract from the look of the watch. It just is almost a nice point of visual interest that almost draws you in to the fact that it's three dimensional. It draws you into the depth of the watch. And thankfully, because the markers are not three-dimensional or applied, there isn't a, a much area to kind of go wrong or have a bad QC with. Of course, I guess you can say the uh, application and printing and painting could be kind of splotchy or, or messy, but here it is very fine and very well done, and there isn't really any imperfection I see on any of the markers. Looking at the Minus Track itself, it has this kind of weird texture that I really didn't expect from it. It is almost uh, pebbled. It is almost... Uh, Kind of like frosting on a cake is kind of the best way I can explain it. Uh, and I think that the main reason is because it is loomed itself. So I think it is almost built out of solid loom. So you kind of get that weirdish appearance to it. It doesn't really look weird or something that draws your attention on a wrist. So it only kind of gives this appearance when you get closer to it. And it's not that it's badly done. It's just an interesting texture. I didn't, really haven't seen before and I didn't expect to see. But again, with that being said, the printing is still done very well, very crisply, very cleanly. There aren't really any QC issues I see, even right down to like this 12 o'clock triangular pip. It all lines up very well and just looks really nicely done. Moving on to the hands here, as you can see, they are the roughest part of the watch. Again, this is a prototype version. But with that being said, it is the only applied metal element on the watch and is also the least well-finished part. You can see there are some scratches, some dings. There's a little bit of kind of uh, I guess extra metal fluff on the, the hand itself. You can see the shape of the watch is pretty interesting. It is bifaceted. Uh, it is a little bit longer, quote unquote, than like a Mercedes hands without the Mercedes symbol. It almost has like a little Pokeball symbol right there, which is kind of interesting. Uh, if you look at the Minutes hand itself, again, it does continue with that bifaceted nature. It's a little bit more of a traditional sword hand here. The way that both of the tips of the uh, hands end looks very nicely done. They are both kind of squared off very slightly at the end. It's a little bit different than I'm used to. Usually I see like very sharp pointed ends, but this gives it a nice more sporty-ish type of appearance, and I like that. The hour hand is slightly better finished, but we do still see like splotches and marks and some dust and some scratches. So again, the hands are the least well-finished part. At the end of the day, this is a prototype. It is also nice to see that the seconds hand itself is also bifaceted. A lot of people will do like bifaceted hands and then have the seconds hand as a just a flat one-dimensional piece. So overall, this hand has some nice finishing to it, and if we follow it along, it also ends in a triangular uh, tip, which goes all the way, all the way out to the edge of the seconds track, which is nice to see. I think the dial is pretty well done. There's a lot of three-dimensionality to it. Um, there's a lot of interesting little design elements like the silver print uh, and just kind of all the loom that is on the dial itself. The hands are a little bit of a letdown, but I think that's mainly due to it being a prototype. Otherwise, this is a pretty nice dial. So moving on to the case of this watch, and I think this is just as well done as the rest of the watch itself. You can see here that the finishing is not that complicated, but it is nicely finished. We do have mainly brushing on the top sides. We have vertical brushing, which follows nicely down into the vertical brushing of the bracelet. You do have a polished chamfer here along each side of the watch, which kind of is the biggest at the end here and thins out towards the crown where it becomes almost non-existent and then comes back out again, which I think is a really cool touch. Uh, the kind of polished edge, polished chamfer continues its line down into the edge of the bracelet where it is also polished. And I think that is nice. It, continues the design language. The sides of the case is very finely horizontally brushed. You do have a very nice curvature to the mid case itself, so it will conform very nicely on wrist. You do have a fairly large case back that has a lot of height to it, but just because of the way watches tend to wear, this will end up sitting down into the wrist and the case, because it conforms so nicely, it does kind of hide its height very well. Very nice 3D embossed crown there. Very high quality, very nice looking. There's also a very good knurling to the crown. It's very easy to screw and unscrew. But as again, when I mentioned in the beginning, the one, we do have a ghost date window, which is a little bit annoying. You can feel the uh, date window clicking under there. But two, when you kind of pull it out and set the time, there's a very gritty feeling to it. It is not the smoothest, most premium feeling movement. Is this because it's a prototype? 
I'm not sure. I think that is just having to do with the movement uh, from other Miyota 9015s or EDA 2824s or other movements around this price point that I've tried. They're usually a little bit smoother than this, so that's a little bit of a bummer to see, but as it stands, it's not a deal breaker. The bezel is done very well. One thing that the owner of the brand did mention is that this bezel is a little bit more stiff than the production models will be. And trust me, this is a very hard bezel to move. And also the knurling isn't great. Like it's very hard to get a quote unquote like purchase on the bezel itself. So it's hard to just grip it. It's hard to move it. You kind of have to like push down on the bezel to get like a downforce and then turn it. A little bit annoying to do, but I again, I, I trust in the fact that he said the bezels on the production models will be easier to turn. One thing I would say is maybe the uh, knurling needs to be a little bit more defined just to be able to grab it a little bit more. But to be fair, don't use my dive bezels very often anyway, so it's kind of a non-issue for me. It's very interesting to have a fully graduated bezel here. To me, it leans a little bit dressy, almost dress sport, uh, and the bezel itself is more sporty leaning. To me, it, to, surprisingly, it doesn't feel at odds too much, and it looks good. Uh, it's just something that I figured I should point out. The ceramic has a nice glossy sheen to it and it does color match the dial pretty well. Moving on to the bracelet, and this is one of my favorite points about the watch. This is a very nicely engineered bracelet. It's almost like <laughs> if Laurier took their bracelets and actually made them the way I would want them to be made. We do have this very flat link style design. Obviously you can see it catches the light amazingly well and that's mainly because you have these multi facets along the links themselves. You have this very broad, flat, uh, vertically brushed part. And then you do have, still brushed, but you have this tiny little curve down or cut down on each side of every single link. Uh, and it just catches the light so well, one, because of the fine brushing, but two, because of that uh, three-dimensional look. The links are also fairly thin. We do have screw links too, which is always nice to see. We have a push button deployant clasp here. Really sturdy, really nice feeling. Nice engraved logo here into the clasp. We also have a little micro adjust system here that's like ratcheting, so you can kind of push this to pull it out. Uh, and then you can kind of push it back in to be whatever fit you like. You also do get three different holes of micro adjust, which is nice to see they didn't leave it only to this little quick fly adjustment system. The bracelet is fairly comfortable. I will say the clasp is a little bit beefy compared to the rest of the bracelet, but it does offset the watch case, so I don't mind it too much. I could probably do without the diver's extension, but it is a nice on the fly thing. And honestly, the most perfect fit for me is actually using the diver extension like one tiny click out. That's just kind of how the bracelet fit me best. So it is useful. Looking at the case back, we have the brand's logo, very much 3D etched out into the case back, sandblasted on the back, polished in the front. Uh, very, very visible, very three-dimensional and very premium feeling. The text is also done in a very nice way. You have some inner text here and some outer text. Uh, nothing too crazy, just the classic text that most watches have. What is nice to see is the brand went for a quick release for the end links of the bracelet and they also have extra straps that they sell that are quick release. So changing the strap is very easy to do. It does feel very sturdy and that's always a nice feature to have. So moving on to how this watch wears on wrist. Earlier I was wearing my Skurfa Diver 1 here. And I just kind of wanted to wear this watch, especially because if you compare these two, they have a kind of similar dial inspiration to them. I would say in person, it, it's kind of funky because on camera, the, the scurf is almost looking better done here, but I can tell you in person, I do like the way the, the Tiseno kind of lights up. It has a interesting color depth to it. The I, I would say the scurf is almost a little bit more dramatic in its shift, whereas the, the Tiseno has a little bit more of a gentle color shift and really not knocking you over the head with that intense brushing. So here we have the watch sitting on my six and a half inch wrist, and I do really just love the way this watch wears. I love the case shape. I love how the case shape integrates with the bracelet link design. I think it all looks perfect and harmonious, and it is just a well-designed watch. It is a well-wearing watch. It sits very close to the wrist. There really aren't any gaps between the watch and my wrist at all. Uh, so it is very comfortable on wrist. There aren't any sharp edges. The crown maybe is on the slightly larger side, but that's not a deal breaker at all. We do have fairly short lugs. You can see the lugs are thickest uh, kind of in the beginning of the case and very much thin out towards the very end. So it has this very sleek appearance. It draws your eye in towards the bracelet and the bracelet just plays with the light. So that draws your eye in as well. So there's a lot to love about this design, about how it fits and about how it just comes together. It definitely is one of those 
watches where it feels greater than the sum of its parts. From the side, as you can see there, it does conform really nicely. It doesn't rise up too high off the wrist. There is a, just a very, very comfortable, the way it sits in, the way it, you know, quote unquote, digs into the wrist. Uh, and the bracelet as well just conforms very nicely. It's nice to have female end links. I know the first kind of production run or the first design theory for this watch had male end links and the fact that they went for the female makes it so much better wearing and I think integrates into the design language a lot better from the pictures that I've seen. Moving the watch a little bit up on my wrist, I have it closer to a six inch wrist here and it still fits perfectly fine. I still have clearance on either side. So you can probably go down to easily maybe a five and a half inch wrist, maybe a little bit lower. Again, just kind of look at how long the lug to lug length is compared to the lug to lug kind of area on top of your wrist. But this is a very well-wearing watch. It's a very nice size. It's always great to see a little bit more of a mid-size diver. Uh, and I just really like how this one wears. Trying the watch first on its in-house brand-made strap. This is a beautiful Tropic strap that's actually really well-made and really pairs very nicely, not only with the, just the blue tone itself, but just with the watch design. I'm usually not the biggest fan of Tropic straps. One, because they're usually a little bit thicker at the ends and you can kind of see it, it has an almost like unfinished, more uh, bulbous kind of part here towards the end that I usually don't like to see. But because this has a fairly short lug to lug length, it just integrates perfectly with the wrist. You don't really see that. There isn't any gap between the case and the strap itself. And this is probably one of the best looking kind of Tropic straps I've seen on a watch personally. Uh, I've tried this Tropic strap on some of my other watches and it just doesn't look as good. So with this design, it's a home run. So here we have the watch on my wrist. You can definitely tell what I mean. You don't really see much of the kind of very, very end piece of the Tropic strap. It almost like pseudo conforms to the case itself, even though that doesn't really. Obviously it's very, very long. So if I, this was my watch, I would just kind of cut it and to kind of simulate that. You can see the strap there. That just looks to me amazing in my opinion. It works really, really well with the watch design. I love the texture that the Tropic adds. I love just the feel of it. It's very comfortable. It has the quick release bars. The colors match perfectly to the watch. I just do really, really like this, and it's not very often I really like a, a first-party strap option, uh, nonetheless from a Michael brand. Next, adding a little bit of color to this watch, we have this nice Batero leather from King Leathercraft. The blue and the kind of tan, gold, and brown work really well together. The white stitching matches perfectly with the white dial. It, it makes it a little bit dressier, of course, and I think the dial lends itself that way anyway, so it works perfectly. The feel that I get from this watch is very reminiscent of like the Black Bay 58. To me, I actually prefer this a little bit more just in the wearing experience and just the, the way it actually works with straps to where I don't think the Black Bay 58 works as well. Or to be honest, it might just be my bias of not liking the dial design of the Black Bay 58. I don't like how the Snowflake Hour Hand is at kind of odds with the circular pips, whereas here we have a circular hour hand and circular pips. So it might just be my preference, but <laughs> digressing, the brown strap looks great. Making a very fun combo, we have this blue stingray leather strap. I don't remember where I got this from. I got it from eBay, but I don't remember the seller, so I'll have it linked down below. It is very supple, it's fairly thin too, and I think the tones match pretty well. It isn't a perfect blue color match, but I think the blue still works well. Looks pretty good, integrates pretty well, and to me is very, very comfortable and just a fun nautical style combo. And last but never least, my Archer silicone strap off of Amazon, or to be fair, you can also buy it from the Archer website. Um, this one I think pairs perfectly. Again, you have so many white tones on the dial itself. The white tone of the strap really brings that out. Love the way this watch looks on the white. Um, I don't know for certain if Tiseno makes a white Tropic strap, but that will also look amazing, especially with how it's integrated. But this silicone strap from Archer is a little bit more low profile, a little thinner, uh, obviously untextured, so it is a little bit more subtle. And I think it just looks fantastic on the watch. So looming up the Tiseno here, we can see it has loomed very, very well. It is appearing a little bit brighter on camera than it is in person, but the loom is applied very generously throughout. It does have a good application, a very visible application. You can see even the second hand is very, very visible. So it, there you have no problem with legibility. It's crazy because you even time something in the dark because you have a fully loomed bezel and fully graduated bezel. If you really need to read your watch in the dark, this is probably the one for you. Looming it up and comparing it to the Timex, as you can see, the color temperatures are pretty even in my opinion. They almost look exactly the same in person. Uh, brightness wise, they are also very similar. Of course, the Tiseno will start dying out faster than Indiglo will, but to me, they did a very, very good job with the Loom application here and put some other micro brands in the same price point to shame. 
So moving on to pros and cons, one of the biggest pros for me is just the build quality of the watch itself. The bracelet is done very nicely. There's a lot of articulation. It's very comfortable on wrist. The way the bracelet itself shines in the light, it just is very, very well executed. And kind of adding on to that point, uh, the watch just wears very well. The case construction is done very nicely. It sits pretty closely to the wrist. It is comfortable on the wrist. There aren't any overly sharp edges. So it is just a really nicely thought out case and a really nice wearing experience. I would say by far my favorite part about the watch is the dial. The dial has that brushed finish, which has a lot of life to it. It has a lot of color depth that is very changing. And I love watches like that because it's not just one thing. It's not static. It's not, this is your black dial and it'll always be a black dial no matter what. It, in some lights, it almost looks black. In some lights, it's more of a gray blue. In other lights, it's more of a very vibrant, saturated blue. It is fun to see how the dial changes and the fact that the dial has changingness to it. And the fact that the dial does have so much life at this price point is really great to see. And lastly, I think there's just pretty good value in this watch. At 649 retail, you're getting a really good constructed watch and bracelet. You're getting a really nice dial. Um, and overall, it kind of does everything you would expect for the price point. I think some may say that movement is an odd choice, and I'll touch on that later. But all things considered, it still is a very, very nice watch, and I think deserving of the price that it's at. So moving on to cons, and one of the biggest cons for me is just the hour hand itself. It just is a little bit small to me. It doesn't blend, I think, overall with the design perfectly. Had they just made that a little bit larger, a little bit almost oversized in a way, not only would I think it would make it feel more vintage reminiscent, but it also just makes the design more cohesive. I think if it matches more closely with the marker size, it would look great. The only other con I have with the watch is the movement. It's not that it's a bad movement necessarily, and I haven't really had much hands-on experience with this movement from Rhonda yet, but the fact of the matter is, at least in the model that I had, it felt a little bit weird to set the time, a little bit weirdish on the winding. So it's one of those things where the feel of the movement isn't perfect, and I have felt nicer at this price point from, you know, Miyota and whatnot. Uh, so at the end of the day, that's something that can be improved upon, or I'm not 100% sure, it might've just been the fact that mine was a sample model. Final thoughts on the watch, and I do really, really like it. Uh, it is a watch that I actually had my eye on when it first came out, I thought it was a really intriguing design, but just like it did in person, the hour hand also just kind of threw me off slightly. In person, I don't mind it as much, but it is still a point of design that keeps me from even wanting to own the watch. Like, had I been given this watch for free, I probably wouldn't wear it that much because I don't like the fact that the hour hand feels at odds with the rest of the design. Am I nitpicking? Maybe, but you know, that's kind of what I do. Outside of that one minor flaw that I think can be pretty easily tweaked, it is a fantastic, fantastic watch. It feels a lot better in the hand than I expected it would. Uh, I said it a couple times and I'll say it again, it feels like if Laurier made a modern watch. It has that skin diver, vintage tool type aesthetic, but modernized. It's very sturdy in the hand, everything articulates very nicely, everything comes together pretty nicely on the watch and case body itself. And there was clearly lots of attention paid to this watch, which is nice to see. Is it perfect? No, but most watches aren't, you know? I think at the end of the day, for the value that you're getting in this watch itself, if you like the design and you can get over the hour hand like uh, that I have an issue with, you're getting an amazing watch. I'm very excited to see what this brand comes out with in the future when this model line updates and when they add new models in. The fact that this is one of their first models and it is already so close to the quote unquote like perfected form of what I think it could be, that's a great sign. I enjoyed my time with this watch. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. I appreciate you watching the video as always and I'll see you in another one.